I agree with very, very much of what Kevin said. Um, and from the World Bank perspective, we're obviously uh, very focused on achieving growth in Kenya. Uh, if we had to focus on one particular MDG, I think we would, most of us in the bank would say we're the most focused on the first MDG. It's not that the other ones are unimportant, nor that we are not working on those. We are. But without growth, it's very, very hard for governments to sustain the sorts of interventions that will make it possible to achieve real progress on the other MDGs. So we're, we're very, very focused on growth. And growth in the right way is certainly good for the poor. I was struck a little bit by your comments on Brazil, uh, a country where uh, we've seen very rapid growth over several decades, but also expanding uh, inequality is China. Uh, in China, uh, there has been a, a growth of over 10% per annum since uh, Deng Xiaoping introduced economic reforms back in 1978. Uh, but to, because they started from a very equal society, that growth has occurred alongside quite rapid growth in inequality. And there has been a pretty uh, hot debate in China about whether that's a, a good or a bad thing. But I think that many people believe that so long as the rising tide is in fact lifting all boats, um, uh, inequality is perhaps not the first thing that that China needs to think about. Growth really was the first thing that it needed to think about. And to some extent, I think that's still true in Kenya, although uh, uh, there's no question that the inequality in this society makes it very, very difficult for us to understand exactly what is happening uh, with respect to the, the distribution of growth. And in fact, one of the things that we find very uh, disconcerting in, in the World Bank is that there has been no household survey since 2005, 2006 in this country. And so we really don't have very good data about what's happening to poverty. There are a number of things we can do and we are trying to do to get uh, proxy indications of what's been happening. You can take GDP figures and make assumptions about the impact of inequality to see how per capita GDP has moved over time. And then you can triangulate that with some of the census data which both indicates uh, at a relatively micro level household constituency of about 150 or 200 households, uh, what levels of poverty you're seeing uh, or what levels of income you're seeing across the country. Uh, that can be combined with a review of the assets that people in different parts of the country declare that they have, things like radios, bicycles, refrigerators, televisions, vehicles. Uh, to, to get some sense of uh, uh, how wealthy or not they are. And then there are also the Afrobarometer Afro perceptions uh, surveys that are done very, very regularly, not only in Kenya, but in a lot of other countries, which also give a window on poverty. But none of those things, even all four of those things together, are not giving us the sort of uh, knowledge about what's happening to poverty in Kenya that we would have if we had already completed a, another round of household surveys. And since there's been a gap now of almost seven years, uh, it is very, very due. I know the government's planning to do the next survey in 2013 after the elections, but that really means that, because the survey will take a year, that really means we're not going to have new household level data until about mid-2014. So that's still quite some way away. On the, on the growth side, um, I think Kenya has actually done quite a lot well since uh, roughly 2000. Um, first of all, this is a country in which the government has maintained macroeconomic stability, uh, despite the hiccups that we saw last year. We've had very good uh, uh, management, generally speaking, of inflation and the exchange rate. Uh, there has been uh, good management of debt. Kenya has never actually even been eligible for debt relief. So therefore, it has also never had debt relief. Uh, and that's quite rare for countries at Kenya's level of development. Most countries at roughly the same level have had to get debt relief because they haven't been able to manage their economies as well as Kenya has done. Um, between roughly 2000 and uh, five and 2007, there was a very strong effort made to improve the regulatory environment for business. 
and from something in the neighborhood of 1,300 uh, regulations governing businesses in Kenya, half were eliminated, another half of those that remained were simplified. So there was a, an, an enormous rationalization of the regulatory framework, which really improved the operating environment for business. But then with the elections in late 2007, the post-election violence and all the effort to implement the Constitution, the wind went out of the sails of that effort. And unfortunately, what we've been seeing is that uh, the, the business environment in Kenya has essentially remained a bit stagnant, whereas other countries around the world and within the East African community have been making reforms that have made their business environments better. And the contrast with Rwanda is very striking. Uh, Kenya had the best ranking in the doing business tables uh, uh, about four, four years or so ago when it was in the 80s. Uh, today, Kenya is at 109. Rwanda four years ago was at something like 140, uh, and uh, last year it was at 45. So Rwanda has made enormous reforms and has really leapt toward the top of the tables. Kenya has not made any reforms, and as other countries have, it's been falling behind. And that's obviously very concerning, because at the end of the day, you're not going to achieve a permanent reduction in poverty unless you create a business environment that enables businesses to grow, to create more jobs, uh, and through those jobs to lift people out of poverty. Of course, businesses that are growing are also paying taxes, and it's the tax base that allows the government to uh, fund the redistributive uh, programs that help the poor uh, escape poverty as well. Um, a lot of people think that the donors play a very large role in that, and that's true in many countries, but in Kenya less so than in others, because even in a good year, the donors collectively here don't provide more than about 10% of the government budget. Uh, and since that's about 25% of GDP, we're, we're providing roughly 2.5% of GDP to the, to the government, uh, to, 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 to uh, wealth creation in this country in any given year. Um, so it's really the government's own budget that is carrying the burden that's going to achieve poverty reduction over time. Uh, we've seen pretty good results both in health and in education. Uh, both infant mortality and under five mortality have gone down over the last number of years. Uh, believe it or not, uh, distributing insecticide impregnated bed nets has probably been the single largest contributor to that. Uh, the number of malaria deaths in the country has really dropped very significantly and that's had a very direct impact both on IMR and U5MR. It's a very cheap uh, uh, technology, if you like. Um, on the education side, all of you know free education was introduced under the uh, Kibaki administration. Uh, the story there is that uh, almost immediately something in the neighborhood of 1.2 million children entered the education system. Uh, of course, the infrastructure didn't immediately expand to take in an extra 1.2 million children. Uh, that's been expanding slowly over time. A lot of us were very worried that the quality of education would plummet as a result of having this huge infusion in one go of so many additional children. But the good story is that uh, achievement levels, the quality of education has essentially remained at the same level despite that high infusion of new uh, children. Uh, of course, the quality needs to be improved, but there was a real risk that it was going to drop rather precipitously. And then finally, I think everybody's aware that there's been a very large effort to build business-friendly infrastructure, business-oriented infrastructure, uh, such as uh, new energy generation facilities, uh, both at Alcaria, but also in the Nairobi uh, neighborhood where 240 megawatts of thermal power are being developed right now. Alcaria has 280 megawatts of geothermal. An interconnection is going to be built with uh, Ethiopia, which will bring another 400 megawatts into the country, and then there's also work on a, a wind farm at Lake Turkana, which would have another 300 megawatts. If you bring all that together, you will have doubled the amount of modern energy available to Kenya in about a, well, since uh, 2009. So that's a very significant boost. In addition to that, of course, the uh, Northern Corridor Road Network has been largely rehabilitated. There's now a private uh, concession operating uh, Rift Valley Railways, and we've still still to see the impact of that, but there's hope that that will materialize. Um, the Port of Mombasa remains a serious constraint where I think we would like to see more movement. 
and, and then I guess the other thing I should mention is that uh, there is now a concerted government effort to improve uh, water supply, storage, and production because there has been basically no large investment in water uh, storage and production in this country since about 1991, 92, 93, somewhere in there. Uh, and we all know what happens when we lose water. Uh, we, uh, we don't have it at home, and that might be an inconvenience to us personally, but we also don't have it to run our hydroelectric turbines uh, or our industry. So it has a very direct economic impact as well. Um, uh, Kevin mentioned the new constitution, which is, of course is extremely important, and I think will be a very strong driver of improved equity uh, over time in this country, and we're already seeing the impacts of that. In fact, uh, in our country policy and institutional assessment ratings uh, that the World Bank does for all countries around the world, what we have seen in Kenya over the last three years is a fairly strong improvement in precisely those parts of uh, spent government spending that promote equity, and that has actually raised Kenya's uh, CPIA rating from 3.6 back in 2008 to 3.8 last year, uh, 2010, it's the same this year, which puts it at the very top of uh, the ratings for low-income countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. The only countries with higher ratings in Sub-Saharan Africa are middle-income countries. Um, and that's been quite an improvement, and that's largely been due to uh, changes that are consistent with the new constitution, but that the government was already acting on beforehand, including in health and education, as I mentioned before. Uh, devolution is supposed to be uh, part of the answer, and we think it certainly could be part of the answer, but we're also very, very concerned about how devolution is going to be implemented. Uh, first of all, 15% is not going to be enough to pay, in our opinion, to pay for the uh, functions that are actually supposed to be devolved to the counties under the Constitution. Uh, it, there will be required significant additional financing uh, particularly since the 15% is 15% of the last audited government uh, revenues, and that's the revenues that came two years before the year in which you're actually uh, rolling out the new budget because of how long it takes to do the auditing. They ha the audit has to be completed. 0.5% um, is not very much, as Kevin was saying. Uh, the government will, the, the national government will definitely need to uh, provide some additional grants. Uh, some of those grants will have to be uh, conditional on counties providing certain types of services that they're responsible for now, such as provincial hospitals. Um, but there's a real danger, and this is my key point about devolution, that those counties that Kenyans hope will most benefit from devolution will actually suffer the most because they will have the least capacity, the least developed structures, uh, the least number of uh, skilled and experienced employees to be able to take over the service delivery functions that will be devolved to them. So the transition between the next government, the beginning of the next government and full devolution, which as we all know can take three years under the Constitution under the supervision of a transitional authority is going to be absolutely critical to making uh, devolutions pay off for poverty reduction in the remoter, poorer parts of the country work. Thank you very much.